you. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you would turn to John chapter 3. We're going to start reading in verse 22. I tried to convince Brother Teal last week to, to trade with me and let me teach that one. He, did, he wasn't having it. He didn't let me. And I wouldn't have let him either. I wouldn't have, if I'd have had that one, I wouldn't have traded. But we're going to continue in John chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 22 this morning. And this is right after Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus. And, and we get a little further. There's a few other details there in the, in the middle part of chapter 3. But uh, we come to a point where verse 22 says, After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salim because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth and all men come to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly, because the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled, that he must increase, but I must decrease. Hallelujah. I would if you would lift your hands this morning and let's just call on the name of the Lord in this place. Lord Jesus, we love you. We worship you, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that we have, God, to draw closer to you through your word today, God. I pray, Lord, for a spirit of revelation and understanding in this house this morning, Lord, that you reveal your word into our hearts and our minds so that we might be changed by the revelation of your name. And we declare it so, and we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ this morning. Hallelujah. Somebody give the Lord one more hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can be seated this morning. Uh, there are a few topics that as an apostolic, it doesn't matter how many times that you've heard them preached. Uh, it's, it doesn't matter how you could hear them every week. And there's something about those particular topics that you still get excited every time you hear them. There's something about hearing that salvation message preached. There's something about it. I don't care if you've heard it every day for all of your life. When you hear that message, when you hear about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it should stir you up inside. It, it should create in you a, a, a passion and a hunger for more. It literally has us sitting on the edge of our seat every time that we hear it. There's something about the, the oneness of God that every time we hear it preached, it, it moves me and, and compels me to draw closer to him. There's something about it. There's something so powerful. I, I can remember uh, back earlier this year, we was able to go and, and hear uh, uh, Brother David Bernard teach a, uh, my goodness, that guy, he is just like the walking encyclopedia of all things of the Bible. It's just amazing, and his teaching ability is just uh, unmatched, but we, we were able to sit, and I mean, it was several hours that seemed to just pass like moments. As you're literally on the edge of your seat as he's speaking about the oneness of God and how it's revealed in Scripture. There's something about those topics that, as an apostolic, we, we should never get tired of hearing them. You can't. And, and this one, uh, th this, our lesson this title this morning is The Mighty God in Christ. And while it may not, uh, I may not have the, the same approach as a typical oneness message, I promise you that you cannot bring out the mighty God in Christ without Scripture declaring the oneness of God. It can't be done. But before we even begin to, to lay a foundation this morning or even begin to explain exactly what any of that means, there, there's a few things that we have to agree on before we even get started. 
And you may not agree with the first statement that, that I make, but I, I got a feeling pastor and, and, and the, the, uh, several others in this place will agree. And if you don't agree, it, it's still the truth. If you do not have a hunger for God, if you do not truly desire to know him on a personal level, I very seriously doubt that you will ever receive a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. I, I, you have to have a hunger. There has to be a, a, a hunger and a desire to know him. There has to be. You may know about him, but you will never experience him in the way that he desires for you to experience him. We don't find anywhere in Scripture, it's not there, where anyone denied who Jesus was and received anything from him. Nowhere. We don't find anywhere in Scripture where that happened. Even the demoniac that came, he came declaring who Jesus Christ was. That's why he was delivered and set free. So when you approach God with a hunger and a desire to know him on a more intimate level, which is what he desires of us. That is when you can truly receive a revelation of the mighty God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. The second thing we must agree on is that the revelation of who Jesus Christ is only comes through relationship. Okay? We, we look at Peter. We just spoke about this a couple weeks ago. Look at Peter. There was enough evidence in the first couple days of Peter walking with Jesus. There was plenty of proof there that Jesus could have asked Peter that question then. Peter, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? He, there was enough proof there. There was enough evidence in, in the first few weeks or days of walking with Jesus for him to ask Peter that question. But he didn't ask him that question. He waited until there was a relationship there. There, there was a, 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 a time of walking with Jesus, a, a time of, of waking up every morning with him and, and going to, to bed at night with him there and a knowledge of him there. There was a, a relationship that was built. And at the end of his ministry, he asked Peter that question, who do men say that I am, Peter? Who do you say that I am? You see, it was even though they had developed that relationship and even though that, that Peter understood it, the revelation of Jesus Christ to Peter was not something that came by flesh and blood. It wasn't because Peter read enough. It wasn't because that he studied enough. Jesus even made the statement to Peter. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Come on, somebody. There's a lot of people that get hung up on this revelation, but it is not complicated at all. Matter of fact, I, I, you can sum it up in one paragraph. Are y'all listening this morning? Y'all with me? All right. Every single attribute of God is revealed in the man Christ Jesus. Every single attribute. We find the love of God revealed in Jesus. We find the name of God revealed in Jesus. We find the peace of God revealed in Jesus. We find the creative power of God revealed in Jesus Christ. We find salvation of God revealed in Jesus. And we find the healing power of God revealed in Jesus. And most importantly, we find the face of the invisible, the face of the invisible God revealed in Jesus. I've got a scripture. If you, if you want to turn, find 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. For God, who hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul is telling us here that the God of creation, the one that, that literally caused light to shine out of nothing and out of darkness, has shown that great light in our hearts. In other words, he's revealed it to us through his spirit. His glory, which can only be seen in the face of Jesus. Whew, my goodness. If that don't make you want to shout this morning, maybe you need a defibrillator. Whew. Man. So we got to agree on, on just those two things, first of all, that you must hunger and thirst for him, and you must develop a relationship with him to be able to receive a revelation of him. Now, you can fall in love with Jesus before you have a revelation of him. You can. 
You absolutely can fall in love with him. But I promise you, when you fall in love with him, a revelation of his name is coming. When you truly forsake everything else, forget what you know and, and forget what, what preconceived ideas that you've had and maybe teachings that you've had prior and you just say, God, I don't understand it all, but I love you. And Come on, somebody. When you fall in love with Jesus, there is a revelation of him coming. Hallelujah. Quite often in, in ministry, we're faced with hardships and, and heartaches and disappointments. Some of those, you know, they, they arise when we lack a true understanding of who God really is and who we are and what he's called us to do. Sometimes it's, it's easy enough to control what we do. Sometimes it is. But I often wonder, is that because we just know how to act? All right? Or is it, or is it really because we have a true understanding of who he is and what he's called us to do? I said, the church is real good at going through the motions. The church is real good at looking the part and and talking the talk and and saying what we've been trained to say and to not say maybe what we know not to say. But is that all it is? Is that the only reason that we do what we do or act how we act and, and say those right things and do the right thing is the only reason that those things happen is because we're so well trained? And there's, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with training. We need training. We need to study. We need to exercise ourselves in the disciplines that it takes to live for God. This may be news to you, but that's one of the reasons that we have Tuesday night prayer meeting. Every one of us should be praying in our homes. We should be praying daily. All right? We should be. One of the reasons for Tuesday night prayer is there might be people that are not as familiar with prayer. And maybe they will come and and what they see happen here, they will take it and put it in action out there. All right? We need training. But I I ask anyone in this place this morning, if, if I ask anyone to tell me the difference between a photograph and a hand painted portrait. I mean, it's easy enough to distinguish between the two. I mean, just the title alone gives it a pretty clear distinction. But, and I'm not taking anything away from a photograph. I know that in this modern world, we're, we're constantly taking pictures and selfies, and, and, and there's memories that can be made with, with photographs. I'm not taking anything away from that. But a photograph is simply a 2D image with no depth. All right? It happens in a moment. Photos are even called snapshots for a reason. It's something that happens and it's over so quickly. But when I think about a portrait, it's very easy for us to, to picture maybe great works of art. And even though I'm, I'm no, by no means an art critic or an expert, most of us in here have probably at some point heard of or seen pictures of the Mona Lisa. And I've seen some replicas of that painting as, as well as many other paintings, some copies, some originals. But the first thing you notice when you see a painting like that is the layers. The first thing that you notice when you see that is when you watch someone painting a painting like that is you see that every single brush stroke is seen in the finished product. Come on, somebody. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Even though it may be layers deep under different colors, it takes every stroke to create the perfect image and to create the depth and the detail that we see. And I say that to tell you that it's, it's easy to have a surface level relationship with God. It's easy to just do what we know to do and go through the motions and, and, and do what we've been trained to do. But if we truly fall in love with him, my goodness, we can read his word and, and we can see every brush stroke that he made to lay the foundation for our revelation. And it makes all the difference in the world. When you pick up your Bible and in the first few pages you can read a prophecy about the crushing of the head and the bruising of the heel. And, and you know deep inside you feel a confirmation in your spirit that it's, it's talking about Jesus. And it's talking about Calvary and his victory over death, hell, and the grave. 
when you pick up your Bible just a, a few pages later and you see how that, that God through the water saved mankind in the days of Noah. And you know and you, you understand in your heart that you feel that confirmation in your soul that, that it's, a, it's talking about baptism. 1 Peter 3 and 20 says, which sometimes we were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, the like figure wherein two even does bath, baptism doth also now save us. Come on, somebody. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, it's every brush stroke that we see in the Word of God paints a picture of Jesus. Every page of His Word paints a perfect picture of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You could turn just a few more pages and read about how the God of creation that created the language that we speak and we know, He confounded men's language. But then through the power of His Spirit, He places in us the ability to speak with Him in a heavenly language. Come on, somebody. 1 Corinthians 14 and 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Come on, somebody. It's talking about Jesus. I'm talking about the brush strokes that reveal to us the mighty God in Christ. I'm talking about finding a place of prayer and relationship with Him. But I promise you, you cannot find one place in Scripture, not one place in His Word, that the face of Jesus is not revealed. My goodness, I'm talking about the love of God for His creation in the garden when He could have just started over. I mean, if there was a time to start over when there was only two, that would have been the time to start over. But see, there was something about us. We, we, we were the, the jewel of His creation. And he could have just quit and said, well, whatever, we'll try again later. But he came in the garden and searched for them. He came looking, even though he knew what shape they were in, he came looking for them. And then 4,000 years later, even through the ups and downs of, of sinful humanity, through their falling away and sins against him and worshiping false gods and turning their back time and time again on him, he still came in the flesh and sacrificed his own life on Calvary for one reason, to restore us into a right relationship with him. There is no painting, there is no book, there is no movie that could ever describe in detail the complexity and yet the simplicity of Calvary. There's literally hundreds of prophecies concerning the life and death of Jesus. Page after page of our Bible is filled with those things, pointing to that moment. And yet the only reason that it happened is because he loved us that much. The only reason, because he loved us that much, was willing to put up with all of our junk and all of our nonsense, all of our failures, all of our shortcomings, all of the good reasons that he has to, to just start over. And he loved us enough to hang on Calvary's tree. Bible history is, is replete with men and women, some who seen Calvary and some who didn't, but they were so in love with the God that they served that it didn't just train them. It changed them. From Abraham to Joseph to Moses to Joshua to Rahab and Ruth and David, Ezra and Nehemiah, Isaiah and Jeremiah, we find men and women that may not have had a full picture of Jesus yet, but they fell in love with Jehovah and it changed their destiny. Most of those I mentioned and, and, and many more knew that God was coming himself as the Messiah. They knew it. They, they, it had been revealed to them and they prayed about it. They spoke about it. They prophesied about it and they lived it like it could happen any moment. Every single one of them, they didn't know when it was going to happen, but they lived it like it could happen any moment. They taught it to their children. They passed it down to the next generation and then to the next generation. In almost every recorded interaction we find in Scripture with those that truly fell in love with Jesus, not all of them, but almost every interaction recorded in the Word. 
They're talking about the goodness of God, the love of God, or they're pointing towards Jesus Christ. One or the other. My goodness. With brush stroke after brush stroke through the prophets of the Old Testament, we find detail upon detail, layer upon layer, revealing to us the mind of God and the purpose of God, the plan of God. And for 4,000 years, the prophets and, and, and the saints of God, they, they prophesied and spoke and hoped and waited. And they prophesied and they waited. And then God, for whatever reason, maybe he just decided to let his masterpiece dry for a moment. But for 400 years, there were silence. It was nothing. But then after 400 years, he picked up his brush again and, and began to apply just a few more strokes to the canvas. God found someone faithful enough to listen and to be obedient. The book of Luke tells us there was a certain priest named Zacharias and his wife named Elizabeth. And, and the Bible says they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And even though they were old and beyond the years of bearing children, come on, somebody. These were people that after 400 years of silence, of nothing, were still waking up every day and living it. I don't know how it happened. I, I don't know, but I, I do know one thing. It didn't happen by accident. It was Zachariah's parents and his grandparents and his great-grandparents and his grandparents before that and his great-great-great-grandparents. When they woke up every day, they began to search after the Lord. They fell in love with him. They began to say, it's coming. He's coming. We don't know when, but he's coming. We don't know when it's going to happen, but it's coming. You better study the word. You better find him in the word. You better look for him. You better find him for hundreds of years, 400 years. They seen nothing, they heard nothing, but they was faithful and they passed it down. And there was a generation that arose with Zechariah and, and his wife. And they were blameless before the Lord. And even though that they were beyond the years of bearing children, I believe the Lord spoke and said, it's time that I fulfill the words that I spoke through my prophet Isaiah. We go back to another part of the painting, Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert the highway of our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And then we find John the Baptist was born, and my goodness, there are several accounts by, by different historians. And, and although we, we know really nothing written about his early life in the Word of God regarding it, some suggest that it was not, he was not very old when his parents passed away. Some say maybe he was a teenager. Some suggest it was, it was much younger than that. But either way, because John didn't fit in with those around him, and Scripture doesn't tell us that, but his life tells us this. And, and because he was different, because he was raised different, and because he was raised by good, godly, righteous parents, man, there's a lesson in this if y'all would hear it. He didn't seek after the same things that other kids of his age sought after. He didn't fit in with the kids he didn't follow after those things. And we don't know what level of education that he had, but we do know that his father was a priest. And I promise you that his father and his mother, they taught him about the Messiah. Because you don't have a love for him without a knowledge of him. And you can only find a knowledge of him in his word. Come on, somebody. John knew exactly who he was looking for. He knew exactly what was coming. And how did he know? Because it was taught to him every day. I, I promise you, they were following it just like Moses said. When you wake up in the morning, you talk about it. When you sit down at the breakfast table, you talk about it. I don't know how many of you in this place had, had parents or grandparents that lived it that way. I've heard it said before, that, and, and, and I've seen that with my grandfather, that, that everywhere that he went, that's all that was on his mind. He walked with that every day that, that any conversation we had, 
he would turn it around about the Lord. I remember when this was spoken about someone else, but it spoke to me because it was exactly who my grandfather was. But I can remember he would even get in the car, and as he settled down in the seat, he would say, Glory. It happened because it was every part of his life. I promise you that's the only reason that I'm here this morning. Because of his prayers and my grandmother's prayers and my mother's prayers that they made up their mind. We haven't seen it yet. We know it's coming, but we don't know when it's coming. But we're going to prepare the next generation. Come on, somebody. Hear me this morning. So he took his love for the word and he became that voice of one that cries in the wilderness. And he began to declare that the Messiah was coming. And he began to preach and plead with the people to turn from their wicked ways and repent before God. Everywhere he went. And then we find as the finishing touches are being placed on the canvas of time, as the final brush strokes of John's life are being applied. We find him down by the river and he's preaching and teaching and baptizing into repentance. And, and everything that John knew, everything he had preached, everything he had read in the word, God literally placed the perfect fulfillment of his entire life's purpose right in front of him and came walking down that dusty road. Come on, somebody. That's what it's going to be like when we see Jesus coming in the sky. That's what it's going to be like when we find the perfect fulfillment of everything we've taught, everything that we fell in love with, everything that we found in his word, when he reveals himself to us. Come on, somebody. Can you imagine being there as John sees Jesus coming down that road? And we don't know much about that interaction between him and Jesus other than the baptism account. That, but what we do know is the reaction of John and the effect that it had on the rest of his life. See, I believe that John understood the Scripture. He understood the prophecy that pointed to Jesus. He understood that he was the one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. He understood the brush strokes, layer upon layer, painting the perfect picture of the glory of God revealed in the face of Jesus. And when he came face to face with the mighty God in Christ, we can look at his reaction as our example of how we should respond when he is revealed to us. Come on, somebody. That hard life that John had to endure, his parents maybe passing at a young age, living the life of a Nazarite and the vow that goes along with it. Uh, we, we find, it, not in Scripture but through history, we find he wasn't even able to attend the, the funerals of his parents because as a Nazarite, you couldn't be even around something that was dead. That was a vow, and it drove him into the wilderness. It drove him there because he was different, and he loved the Word more than the world. And, and we don't find John in that moment. We don't find him responding with, now it's my time to shine. Now it's time to say, I told you so. I told you he was coming. We don't find John standing up and trying to make himself better known. Faced with the reality of the revelation that stood before him, John responded like we should respond this day. For he must increase and I must decrease. And that's the revelation that we must receive from this entire lesson this morning. Because when we truly receive a revelation of who Jesus Christ truly is, that he is God manifest in the flesh, the God of all creation came to dwell inside of me, that can be only your response. My goodness. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place this morning. I told y'all this is one of them subjects when you talk about the oneness of God, when you talk about a revelation of Jesus Christ. I don't care how many times that you've heard it. I don't care how many times that I've taught it. I don't care how many times I've been in services where it's mentioned. Every time that I hear it, it does something in here. And it lets me know that I must decrease, but he must increase. I must do whatever it takes so that I can decrease and he can increase. We know that John met an untimely end at the hands of wicked King Herod and his evil wife Herodias. But John's ministry, it continued to influence his followers long after he was gone. In Acts chapter 19, 
Uh, the Apostle Paul was on his third missionary journey, and he visits this city of Ephesus. And <clears throat> when he was in Ephesus, he, he meets a group of a dozen of John's disciples. And if you was here a couple Wednesday nights ago, uh, uh, you would know that at a third missionary journey, this was about 20 years or so, roughly 20 years into Paul's journey. So uh, the, John the Baptist had been dead for probably 20 years, somewhere in that neighborhood. But nonetheless, his, his teaching lived on through these 12 men, these disciples of John. And, and Paul, you know, he is talking to them and, and engaging in conversation with them. He noted that they had only been baptized according to John's teaching. And, and, but, but they had apparently, they'd missed one key element and one key emphasis of John's ministry. In Matthew 3 and 11, uh, John declares, he says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And when Paul asked them whether they had been baptized with the Holy Spirit as John promised, they replied, we didn't know. We've never even heard whether there be such a Holy Ghost. We didn't know anything about it. And you know what? Paul could have said, well, you know, man, John, he was a great guy. Jesus said he was the greatest of all the disciples. He, he was, you know, he was top notch. You guys just carry on. You Man, you just keep preaching, keep, keep teaching. Man, you're doing a great work. 20 years after he's dead, you're still carrying a torch. Y'all just stay with it. My Paul, thank God for Paul. He proceeded to give these disciples a little Bible study that, that bridged the gap between John the Baptist and Jesus. He tells them, he said, the purpose of John's ministry, the whole purpose was to point people to the one that should come after him, that is Christ Jesus. And those men, they, they responded to Paul's teaching with faith and obedience. And the word says they were rebaptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I tell you, it's interesting to note, though, that although that John had been gone many years at this point, his humility and his kingdom-minded attitude was reflected still in his followers. Come on, somebody. There is no record in Scripture, and because there's no record in Scripture, I don't believe it happened. There's no record in Scripture of any of these disciples of John arguing with Paul. There's none of them that insisted that my current level of understanding is sufficient. I was baptized by the one that baptized this Jesus you're talking about. That should be good enough. Whew. There was not one case that we find recorded. But instead, what we find, just like their teacher, they accepted the fact, just like John, they accepted the fact that Jesus was the supreme revelation of God. And they were willing to be rebaptized. They were willing to do whatever it took they had a humble spirit and said, God, I didn't know that, but since it's been revealed to me, I'm going to respond in faith. I'm going to take that step and do what, what you've told me that I need to do. And because of that, it's not surprising at all that all 12 men received the gift of the Holy Ghost when Paul laid hands on them. Come on, somebody. That's the power of revelation. That's the power of understanding who Jesus Christ is and understanding that everything we read in Scripture is painting a picture of him and pointing us straight to Jesus. My goodness. I want to experience. I want to experience everything that God has prepared for us. I want everything. I want everything. I, I want the greater things that, that he promised his disciples. I want the, 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 come on somebody, I want the latter rain to be greater than the former. I want to experience that. I want to see the miracle signs and wonders that Jesus promised us that should happen. You know what I think? I think it's time that the church stops asking God for things that he's promised us in his word. 
Come on, somebody. You know what happens when we beg him for things that he's promised us? Do you know what that does? That tells the devil you ain't got it and you don't know how to get it. Whew, come on, somebody. That's some revelation for you. It's time that we declare the word of God. You can only do that when you understand who Jesus Christ is. You can only do that when you have a true revelation. Hallelujah. When you do that and you say, God, I, I want to decrease, you must increase. I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to, to tell someone else about you. I, I, I want your kingdom to grow. I want your, your name to be made known everywhere that I go. You must humbly acknowledge that God has been fully revealed in Jesus Christ. And we must obey his gospel. You must obey. You must be born of the water and the spirit. Come on, somebody. You must be filled with his spirit. You have to be. If you exp Come on, somebody. It's the word of God. Only then will we discover the everlasting life that John the Baptist foretold. I feel like that we as the church, we must be very careful not to just see the picture. Not to just look at the picture. But we must do whatever it takes. We must study. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved. A workman needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We must study the word. We must uncover the brush strokes that bring about the revelation of Jesus Christ in our life. We must uncover those things that make the beauty of the portrait of Jesus Christ come together. For there has never been another masterpiece. There has never been a painting or a book. There has never been any masterpiece more beautifully crafted than the mighty God revealed in Jesus Christ. My goodness, there has never been a more beautiful picture than the God of creation loving us so much that he didn't send someone else. He came himself in flesh for me. Hallelujah. If you would stand to your feet this morning. Hallelujah. I want to receive this morning. I want every person in this place to receive a revelation of who Jesus Christ truly is. And I want you to receive that humbly so that you respond to the word when pastor brings the word in just a few minutes. That we don't respond with, with I just don't know about all that. I, I mean, what I've had so far, I've seen God move in my life this far and, and I've seen miracles and, and he's provided for me and I've got a pretty good understanding of him. I want every person in this place to respond with God. I may not, I don't know it all, but I want to know whatever you want to show me today. Whatever you want to reveal in me today, God, let it be so in my life. Hallelujah.